So the devil was going out of business and organized a car boot sale this coming Saturday. And all his tools were attractively displayed. Among them, as you see up on the screen, jealousy, hatred, malice, deceit, sensuality, pride, and idolatry. Each of these tools was marked with its own price tag. However, over in the corner by itself was a harmless-looking tool, very much worn out, but still it bore a higher price than any of the other tools. Someone asked the devil what this tool was, and he answered, that is discouragement. The next question came quickly. And why is it priced so high, even though it is plain to see that it's worn out more than the others? Because, replied the devil, this tool is more useful to me than all the other tools. I can pry open and get into a man's heart with that, when I cannot get near him with any other tool. Once I get inside, I can use him in whatever way suits me best. It is worn out well because I use it on everybody I can, and few people even know it belongs to me. This tool was priced so high that no one could buy it, and to this day, it has never been sold. It still belongs to the devil, and he still uses it on mankind. Today's scripture is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, he says, do not lose heart. Do not lose heart. Therefore, since through God's mercy, we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. The word used for lose heart in Greek means to act badly in the face of difficulties to give up or grow weary while pursuing a worthwhile goal. Now, Apostle Paul wrote from experience. He's the most qualified to be disheartened, isn't it? To be discouraged and to lose heart. Because he wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger even from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak? And I do not feel weak. Despite all these experiences, Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians that he does not lose heart. Not once, but two times. Because you can see that in verse 16, he, he repeats the phrase, we do not lose heart. All of us have felt discouraged, and disheartened at one time or another? What makes us discouraged or disheartened? And what can we learn from Paul, from this chapter? Firstly, I believe that Paul do not lose heart as he mentioned in verse 1, because he says that through God's mercy, we have this ministry. Note the word, we have. We have. See, God is a God who um, gives us richly so that we possess something in us that will cause us to be encouraged um, in the face of difficulties. We have. And as you read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the word we have is mentioned a couple of times. And Paul wants to 
to remind us what God has given to us already. And we, we need to remember that we have many spiritual blessings that God has poured into us. And in this instance, Paul says we have this ministry. And what is this ministry that he's talking about? In the previous chapter, he mentioned about this ministry when he compared the new covenant with the old covenant, which is the Mosaic law, which the Jews follow to this day. But Jesus came to bring a new covenant. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, Paul says, He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. This ministry of an, the new covenant is a much more glorious ministry because it brings righteousness instead of condemnation. It is a ministry of the Spirit that brings life instead of the ministry of the old covenant that brought death. It's a world of a difference, life and death. And that is the ministry that God has given to Paul and to each of us, each of us. Through his mercy, Paul remembered that Jesus encountered him on the road to Damascus and transformed his life from one who persecuted Christians to one who is called to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. A new purpose and a new calling in his life. Given this privilege and high calling, Paul did not lose heart or get discouraged, but instead he preached the gospel boldly and in truth. Paul is talking, speaking to us today because every member in EEC is an effective minister of Jesus Christ, right? Amen? Because the EEC mission statement says, EEC is an apostolic, cell-based church committed to obeying the great commandment and to fulfilling the great commission by motivating, equipping, and empowering every member to be an effective minister of Jesus Christ. So all of us here today, seated here, we are called and given this same glorious ministry of the new covenant through the mercy of God. Paul's central focus in his preaching of the gospel is Jesus Christ. It's always Jesus Christ. He says, for what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have, will have everlasting life. That is the central message of the gospel because Jesus came to die for our sins so that we can be reconciled to God. This ministry of reconciliation has been given to us. God's redemption plan is to restore all of us to become his sons and daughters, not only in name and position, but also in our life, conduct and character, because he wants us to be more and more like his son, Jesus. And God does this through justification, sanctification and glorification, big words. Justification just means that we are saved when God declares us as righteous through faith in Jesus. When we come before God and repent of our sins, God forgives us because Jesus has paid the price. And as we put our faith in Jesus, the righteousness of God is credited to our account. Sanctification really just means that we are being safe because as we know, sin still dwells in us. We still sin. And so God works in us, transforms us to become holy and righteous. 
And glorification means that we will be saved. We will be saved. When God's finally remove sin from our lives, when we are resurrected with new bodies and are presented together with Jesus as God's sons and daughters. And even today, this uh, glorious gospel is being preached. And as it's preached, what happens is that light shines out of darkness. For God who said, light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. We see God when we see Jesus because Jesus is the image of God. In the face of Jesus, we see God. Paul echoes the word that was spoken in creation Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. It brings us to this act of creation, that when light shines in our hearts, we become a new creation. Paul is saying here that the same God who originally commanded light to shine out of darkness has shone in our hearts, in the first creation, God commanded the light to shine, but in the new creation, God himself shines into our hearts. How much more personal this is. However, the enemy, the God of this age, works to blind the eyes of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light. But God's word says that to those who turn who turn and put their faith in Jesus, that blindness, that will will be lifted from them. And we praise God because He's able to do that. Although some of us may encounter people who have not responded to the gospel, although we have shared to them, we could be discouraged because of that. Especially our loved ones, uh, ones that we have um, um, preached the gospel to, uh, but they have not responded. We can get discouraged and disheartened. But Paul is saying that be encouraged because the light of God will shine through. We need to pray that God will lift up the veil from their eyes. We move on to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 to 12. It reads, But we have this treasure in jars of clay, that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. What is this treasure? This treasure refers to the gospel, the ministry uh, that has been given us, this treasure. However, we note that this treasure is put into jars of clay. What are jars of clay? You can see in the picture there, there's a jar of clay, cracked a little bit. Um, they are used um, to store water, oil, wine. And uh, there was a wedding in Cana where we read about the jars of clay that was storing huge amount of water where Jesus turned the water into wine. These are ordinary jars, fragile, it can be broken, it can crack. And it's a picture of us, because we are jars of clay. Because we are effectively weak and fragile. Our physical bodies are getting weaker as we grow older. I think some of us are starting to feel that. We have a fallen nature marred by sin. We have character flaws. We fail to live up to God's standard and oftentimes even to our own standards. Yet God chose to do it this way, to use us, ordinary, 
fragile, weak people, to be containers of his gospel and his light, the treasure in jars of clay. Are we discouraged when we look at ourselves sometimes, all our, all our weaknesses, all our failures? Paul says, no, do not be discouraged. Instead, be encouraged because God has put his treasure in us, even though he knows how fragile and weak we are. So we do not need to project ourselves as strong and perfect all the time, but acknowledge that even in our weakness, the treasure of the gospel can still shine true. Amen? So tell your neighbours, we are jars of clay, but we have this treasure in us. It's amazing that God choose to do it this way, but why did God choose to use us, these weak and fragile jars of clay? That's because He wants to demonstrate that the surpassing power comes from God. So that when something extraordinarily happened, people will say, it cannot be the jars of clay. Can't be. This must have come from God. And the glory is given to God. So this brings us to the second reason why Paul is not disheartened. Because he knows that God's surpassing power works in him and in us. The word for power, uh, the Greek word is dunamis, or in English we use dynamite. What is dynamite made of? It's made from mixing nitroglycerin with earth to stabilize and reduce the volatility of the explosive. So the earth is an absorbent material which soaks up the nitroglycerin. So this picture shows the surpassing power of God mixed with earth, our human frailty, to produce this dynamite power, this dynamite power. And how is this surpassing power demonstrated in us? Paul unpacks that in verse 8 and 9. He says, he is hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. The word hard-pressed means to press in hard against, uh, squeeze the life out of a person. Uh, brings to mind the Hills Hillsborough incident uh, during the football match where crowds were crushed and actually resulted in death of 96 spectators. So this pressing in this crushing has the effect of squeezing the life out of a person. But Paul says that because the surpassing power works in him, he's not crushed. He's not crushed because God always provides a way out. So although he's hard pressed, he's not crushed. Secondly, he's perplexed, but not in despair. To be perplexed means to be at a loss how to act when there are situations that assails us and we just don't know what to do. So Paul says that although many times he is perplexed, yet he is never in despair, never utterly at a loss because God is the God who will again open a way out for him. Thirdly, he says he's persecuted, but not abandoned. To pers the, the word for persecuted means to pursue, and is commonly used to, of tracking a prey or enemy. It's, it's like a lion going after a deer. So the deer will feel persecuted because the lion's going after it. Paul was pursued in the same way from city to city by hostile Jews. But through it all, God never abandoned him. God did not leave Paul behind. 
or in the lurch for the enemy to pick up. And finally, Paul says he's struck down by the enemy, but not destroyed. It's like a boxer who was knocked down, but not knocked out. Paul was not only pursued by hostile Jews, but when they caught up with him, they stirred up trouble whenever they could. There was even a time when he was stoned at Lystra and left outside the city for dead. And yet he lived. God never abandoned him. Hard-pressed, perplexed, persecuted, struck down, are summed up in the clause we always carry about in our body, the death of Jesus or the dying of Jesus, a term that stresses the ongoing nature of the process. When we think of the dying of Jesus, we tend to think of the cross. But Paul has in mind not only the cross, but also the hardships, the troubles, frustrations that Jesus faced during his three-year ministry, the loneliness, disappointments with his disciples, the betrayal, uh, the disbelief of his family, the mocking and jeering of his foes, going to the cross, suffering and death. Paul acknowledged that these are wearing effects of a minister of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus himself says that to all his disciples, you must deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. So as ministers of Jesus, we are not surprised to encounter these hardships. So don't be surprised as you serve God when you face difficulties, opposition, rejection, loneliness. This is part of parcel of what Jesus went through. But in the midst of that, we can be encouraged because the surpassing power of God is demonstrated in us jars of clay. The Corinthians, like many Christians today, believe that adversity was inconsistent with the spirit-filled Christian life. We often expect God to show His power through miracles, signs and wonders. But Paul, on the other hand, maintained that God's power is able to make itself known most effectively through hardship and distress. Dying and yet we lived on, beaten and yet not killed, having nothing and yet possessing everything. It is in Paul's very weakness that the life of Jesus is revealed. God's surpassing power is manifested in jars of clay. And therefore, we can be encouraged. So tell your neighbor right now, God's surpassing power is at work in you. Be encouraged. Thirdly, we move to 2 Corinthians 4, verse 13 to 15. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. And this quotation comes from Psalms chapter 116, verse 8 to 10. It reads, For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believe, therefore I spoke. I am greatly afflicted. You see, the psalmist, even in the midst of his affliction, knew that God is a God who would deliver him. And therefore, because of his faith in this God who would deliver him, he opens his mouth and he speaks. So Paul can identify with the psalmist having gone through much affliction. And he says, I have the same spirit of faith. 
I believe, and therefore I speak. The afflictions and persecutions of Paul's life did not seal his lips. Wherever there is true faith, there must be the expression of it. It cannot be silent. This is the secret of his fearlessness in uttering the Christian message, in proclaiming the gospel. He knew that this life was not all. He knew that for the believer, there is this certainty of resurrection. The same God who raised up the Lord Jesus would also raise Paul up and present him with the Corinthians. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. So here we have this faith in God that God planned for us is a, is a wonderful plan because God is going to resurrect us together and to present us in His presence, blameless. And I, even as I was reading that, the presentation of us as His sons and daughters, as the bride of Christ, wow, what a picture. Not only resurrecting us, but also presenting us as sons and daughters. We can be discouraged sometimes from speaking about God because of challenges in our lives, difficulties, afflictions. But today God wants to assure you, reassure you that even in the midst of your affliction, He is with you and He will be your deliverer and the one who raises you up and presents you blameless. So be encouraged, brothers and sisters. And finally, from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 to 18, Paul says, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Paul encouraged us to put on a new pair of spectacles, a new perspective. See, our outward person is wasting away, but what is actually happening? Our inward person is being renewed day by day. Wow! What a new perspective of our human experience, isn't it? Because our outward bodies can be getting weaker, frail, but God's power is renewing us day by day. And Paul describes his afflictions as light and momentary. When we, just now we read about Paul's affliction, a whole list of that, we, we can't describe that as light, can we? They are really heavy. You know, most of us have not experienced that, not even to, uh, you know, 10%, you know. So there's, um, so why, why is it that how is it that Paul described his afflictions as light? It is only light when it, it is compared with the weight of the glory awaiting him. It's only in comparison. Wow, the weight of the glory awaiting him. What is my present affliction? It's light. And it, it is momentary when we look at it in view of eternity, the time frame that we're here, 70 years, 100 years, that's just momentary. So when we put on this new perspective, we can be encouraged because God has for us this eternal glory awaiting us. 
These afflictions are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So today we want to be encouraged because our God is a God who loves us. Our God is a God who has given us this ministry, this life-giving ministry, this gospel treasure that brings light into the hearts of men. We ourselves have received this mercy. And therefore, we can be encouraged because this treasure God has given us, we are encouraged to speak and preach and minister. And we know that God can remove the veil that is blinding um, unbelievers. When they turn to Him, God will remove this veil. And so we can be encouraged too, you know, as we um, minister and witness to our loved ones, the hard nuts that hasn't been cracked yet. We know that God is able to, and we learn to pray, Lord, will you lift up this veil from their eyes so they can, they can see how much you love them. And we can be encouraged because we have this surpassing power of God working in us, jars of clay, in the midst of our own weaknesses and frailties. God's power is manifested all the more, all the more to His glory. So we can be encouraged. And we can be encouraged because we have faith in God, in the God who will deliver us who will raise us together with Jesus and present us blameless before Him. And finally, we can encourage brothers and sisters, when we put on this new perspective that sees our present afflictions as light and momentary because these afflictions are achieving for us this eternal weight of glory. So I just want to encourage all of you uh, this morning that as you serve God, as you walk through difficulties, opposition, that you do not need to be disheartened, but you can take heart because God has given us all these things and God is with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.